Greetings, 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 and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the newest installment of the Adama Art Salon. Uh, my name is Dr. Fahamu Baku, and I'm happy to uh, be here today to uh, be able to participate in uh, yet another uh, amazing salon panel. Uh, today, our panel featured the Adama Executive Board. In this session, we'll be a little different from ones that we've been doing in the, uh, over the past uh, eight weeks or so, um, in that it's more of a round table and talk back. Um, and we're really hoping to engage with you all, uh, with our audience, um, to take your questions and uh, you know, allow you to hear a little bit more about the emphasis behind Adama and uh, what we have planned for the future. But more than that, to really you know, be able to hear from you, get feedback from, from you, our audience, in terms of how been feeling about the work that we've been doing so far and, and perhaps even uh, some ideas about things that we might be able to do uh, moving forward. So uh, before uh, we get into that conversation though, I'd uh, like to go ahead and introduce our board members. Um, a few of our members are unable to join us today, but we will uh, still introduce them nonetheless. Uh, but I'll start with the ones who are here. Um, first up, we have uh, Heather Infantry. Um, Heather is the executive director of Generator, uh, which is a nonprofit organization here in Atlanta that brings together various organizations to think about, plan, and uh, conceive of ways to bring community together uh, in meaningful and powerful ways. Uh, Heather is a, uh, originally from Toronto by way of Jamaica, married to uh, Mr. Corey Johnson, wonderful uh, musician. Uh, Charles, mother of two beautiful daughters and a really good friend. Heather, how are you doing? Thanks, Fahamu. Happy to be here. Greetings from Reynolds Town in Southeast Atlanta. <laughs> Next up, we have uh, Miss Valerie Boucher. Uh, Valerie is a real estate project executive, community advocate, and sustainable community development specialist at Bellwood Investments, located in Atlanta. Uh, uh, Valerie has a uh, number of years of experience working in real estate and development, um, mother to two amazing sons, uh, and mm -hmm. all around badass Bronx girl, CAU graduate. What's up, Mel? Hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here as well. Uh, and next up, we have uh, my good friend, Aisha Rashid Hyman. Um, Aisha, uh, for for anybody in Atlanta, you already know who Aisha is, but for those of you outside of Atlanta who are tuning in today, you need to know that Aisha is one of the most amazing uh, producers uh, in the game uh, at any level of engagement when it comes to production, from concert production to television, uh, film. She has uh, uh, been working in production for as long as I've known her, um, uh, producing concerts and uh, various events. Um, she also uh, is wife to one of the most amazing DJs in the country, uh, DJ Kimmett. Uh, I would say on the planet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I stand corrected. In the galaxy. <laughs> I stand corrected. Um, but uh, uh, Aisha is, is, is an amazing um, uh, visionary thinker and leader various corporate uh, positions, and we're just really excited to have her. Uh, and I'm just really be really honored to be on the board, and of course to talk with everyone on the on the panel today. Yeah. And uh, next up, we have uh, Mike Ewing. Um, Mike is based in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, curator, um, visionary thinker. Uh, you know, this man is the man of a, a million ideas. Uh, and uh, just you know, one of the most uh, passionate uh, people that I've ever met uh, when it comes to thinking about art, thinking about artistic engagement, and, and ways of making art accessible, uh, palatable, uh, and, and building bridges, uh, you know, across communities. Uh, you know, Mike is probably, well, he is uh, the youngest member of our board, but, you know, his, his, his youthful zeal keeps us all on our toes. So Mike, mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you so much. I'm uh, happy to be here. 
So I'm glad to have you here, Tony. You can get my hat too, bro. <laughs> Representing Nashville. Um, so I'm going to introduce our uh, remaining uh, board members real quick who were unable to uh, uh, join us today, um, but whose support and whose uh, hard work uh, we, we, we would not be here without, without their work. So uh, Brother George Gomez, uh, uh, a graphic designer born and raised in New York City. Uh, uh, George graduated from FIT. Uh, he lives here in Atlanta with his wife, uh, Christy, and his son, Eli. And, uh, you know, George is uh, one of the most amazing uh, visual, visual uh, thinkers that I know of. Um, his ability to translate ideas and brands into a visual system is, is, is unparalleled. Um, we're really, really grateful to have him as a part of our team. Um, Darwin Brown uh, has over 20 years wealth management experience. Uh, he is a uh, accomplished trust and state's attorney based in Chicago. Um, he's also an educator and actively involved in the arts community as both a uh, advocate as well as a collector. Um, and last but not least, uh, Soho Galbraith, uh, who is the chief, chief executive consultant at Sohe Solutions. Um, and so he left a, uh, a really uh, storied career in corporate America to, to transition her skill set to assisting artists and creatives and establishing best business practices and, and protocols. Um, she also works with a number of artists uh, and, and creatives and small businesses in terms of uh, tax and accounting support. And uh, she's also, along with her husband, George uh, Albrecht, who is an amazing artist himself, uh, founders of Articulate ACL, which is a nonprofit organization which helps to provide support for um, high school arts programs, uh, as well as artists who live and work in the community. So um, with that, that is the Adama Executive Board. Um, oh, by the way, I'm Bahamut Fuku, for those who don't know. Um, I'm also an artist, uh, and uh, yeah, this has been a passion of mine. Adama's been a passion of mine for about the last three years, but um, we're happy to be here today and looking forward to diving into the conversation with you guys. Mm -hmm. um, so based on the agenda that we set forward, I, I guess it's my turn now to just talk a little bit about the impetus behind uh, Adama, and then we'll launch into a little bit of conversation about the, the why each of us are engaged or involved with this uh, endeavor. Um, so for me, uh, maybe about three or four years ago, I was having a conversation with a friend about the lack of uh, advocacy for Black artists in the city of Atlanta and thinking about ways that we might be able to provide a platform of support, uh, particularly for artists of color who live and work in the city, um, because uh, you know, there, there, there isn't a body that exists um, as such. Um, but as I thought more about that, I really began to think about the, the lack of institutional representation for, uh, for Black artists uh, in the city. Um, and just the, the very limited space or the limited voices within the arts institutional representation in Atlanta. Uh, uh, Atlanta is a major, major city with a lot of things going on. And we often talk about Atlanta being this mecca of black culture. We often talk about Atlanta being this, uh, uh, long being this, this beacon and haven for, for black people and black professionals. But that's not necessarily represented in the arts in infrastructure in, in the city. Uh, we speak a great deal about entertainment and we know that at Atlanta's hip hop uh, scene and now the film industry is, is thriving, but there's a great and a huge community of uh, artists and fine artists uh, who live and work and call at their home. Um, and we don't necessarily have spaces that uh, allow for that to happen. And this is not to uh, ignore or dismiss the spaces that do exist, such as the Hammond's House Museum and the National Black Arts Festival. Uh, but we are thinking about even more broadly what a space that, uh, that speaks to the Black experience and to the African diaspora could do. And so that's where Adama sort of kind of came in. Uh, you know, we wanted to create a space that uh, 
would become a global destination for uh, for the Black art experience here in Atlanta. Um, the city is a global hub. We have the world's busiest airport. Uh, it just sort of makes perfect sense um, that we have a space like this. And as I have been fortunate to travel around the country and travel around the world, I've been able to experience um, some of the spaces, uh, you know, like the Museum of Contemporary African Diaspora Art in San Francisco, or Mokata in Brooklyn, or uh, uh, the Moab um, in Detroit, and like all of these different spaces that uh, provide uh, not only um, a space for artists of color to show, but also that are pushing the envelope, pushing the conversation around contemporary African diaspora art. Uh, and we wanted to bring something like that to a city like Atlanta, where Black culture is already um, a, a, a major, uh, a major point of attraction um, and a major point of discussion and conversation. Um, so I want to open it up to the rest of the board at this point to just talk a little bit about your own uh, uh, reasoning behind uh, coming on board with the Dhamma and uh you know what your hopes uh, and aspirations are for the institution this is for anyone i guess i can start mm -hmm. so i um as fahamu mentioned I, I grew up in toronto so i came to atlanta in 95. Um, my background is in theater so i was um coming to atlanta in my second year of university to continue my theater studies and growing up in a city like Toronto, where we make up 3% of the population, you can imagine the kind of like sort of cultural shock it was to move to a city mm -hmm. like Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And creatively and culturally, the city completely embraced me in all kinds of ways, just by virtue of the representation and visibility of blackness and blackness across a sort of wide spectrum of identity was just incredibly remarkable and meaningful to me at that time, you know, being a 19 year old. And so um, I've always have felt indebted to Atlanta for being that and providing that for me. And as I have continued my work in the creative sort of nonprofit space um, and constantly being confronted um, with some of the disparity and inequity that um, black artists face in particular, um, considering the kind of important cultural contributions they make to the city. Like Atlanta is not Atlanta without uh, the black architects of culture and creativity that have made this space so incredibly uh, rich and unique. And so it has always been my desire to contribute in some sort of meaningful way that amplifies that, um, that it amplifies it for black people that sort of brings to the forefront the importance and the significance of this. And so when Fahamu was sharing with me his the impetus for this vision, I mean, right away, it, it, it was that moment and opportunity for me to give back to the city and to give back to the diaspora what had been given to me at a, at a point in my development that was so incredible um, uh, to my confidence and, and my sense of expression and identity. Anyone else? So I love what you said, Heather, about feeling indebted, because I really believe in that saying that um, service is the rent that you pay to, to live on this planet. And uh, oh, first, let me say um, Ramadan Mubarak to all the Muslims who are fasting and praying right now. I hope everything is going smoothly for you. It's been great for me. So I hope it's going great for you, too. Um, but yeah, service is like, I feel like as human beings, we all have some sort of debt to pay, something that we should be doing to give back. And um, being raised in the nation of Al-Islam and being raised with a lot of Pan-Africanness, I don't even know how to not think of myself in, in terms of uh, uh, being a part of an African uh, uh, world. That's just kind of the worldview that I was raised in. And I um, have been uh, you know, partnering with my husband to raise our family in. Um, so um, everything I've been doing um, professionally you hopefully see aspects of that uh, in the work that I've been doing. And um, when Fahamu was talking about, you know, what's happening here in Atlanta with film and the art community here and the music community here, to me, it all works together. And I'm excited about Adama 
providing a, a, a space liter literally and figuratively where all of those um, ways in which we express ourselves can live and breathe and, and inform uh, each other. So I'm just, um, to me, Adama speaks to who I am and I'm just excited to be a part of it. Uh, well, so uh, I, no, um, I just, you know, really, I think that it's not by chance that all of us um, have similar feelings to the city, to the vision of Adama, to um, just internally how we live our everyday life and what we want to see. And I think that same, I have the same feeling when uh, Fahamu discussed with us like what the vision for Adama was. It was definitely, you know, I wasn't raised here, but Atlanta took me in, even though, you know, I'm not, I know I'm not native to Atlanta, but it definitely was, it felt like something to give back, to see something else outside of the box. And um, I was just excited to see like how, uh, potentially how history and culture can be shaped and in, in, in informed by the, the influence. It was just like really just to create the influence of what Adama could be, even though it was something that was totally going to be out of the box, it wasn't traditional. Um, and I was just, you know, I totally saw it when he was explaining it to me. It was like, I could see his vision. I could see the vision from everyone else. And it was like, we all got together for a particular purpose. And I'm just excited to see it grow. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, you know, that, I think that's one of the things that really helped me to, uh, to, to understand the impact of what Adama could be was, you know, sharing the vision for Adama, sharing the concept for Adama with each of you, it, it, it like it didn't even take very many words, you know, it's just like mm -hmm. I was thinking of, uh, and then you, whatever, mm -hmm. you mean, I'm in. It's it. yeah. um, and I think that that was a really powerful testament to the, um, to the, the essential need of a space like Adama, right? Um, we, we often sort of lament uh, the fact that some of the institutional spaces here, the museums and, and, and art spaces here, uh, uh, very rarely or, or maybe not to our satisfaction, have exhibitions and programs that feed us, right? Mm -hmm. that, uh, that provide for us the kinds of uh, things that we want to see and the experiences we want to have. And, you know, I, I think for all intents and purposes that uh, most of those spaces really do try to 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 fulfill that need, but you know uh, they can only do so much. You know they they have so many communities that are asking for the same thing, right? Um, and I think a space like Adamo becomes even more imperative uh, because of its focus. It's you know like the, the Spelman College Museum of Fine Art. Um, amazing space they do amazing program and they speak a very specific voice they to, um, uh, black women artists and black women art artistic production um, and you know that when you go to that space that what you will experience is art at its highest level um, created produced curated by um, performed by whatever it may be by black women and that's a powerful statement, right? Um, you don't necessarily have to then be like, oh man, I need the High Museum to show more black women. Mm -hmm. You know, the High Museum can show black women, but you also know that if you go to the Spelman Museum, you will see work by or about black women. Um, and I think that, you know, a space like Obama becomes essential again because it fills a void uh, in our cultural content. Um, that speaks to us, and not only to us, but to the rest of the city and hopefully the rest of the world, um, uh, creating a space for this type of voice to be engaged. And I think the opportunity to, to create a place 
where the center of the culture is blackness without uh, any intent to explain it for the white gaze is a really powerful opportunity that we have in front of us, right? For us to really sort of explore and dig into our traditions, our history, amplify that in a way that puts us at the center. Like, it's funny, like, as I was preparing for this call and I was going through the settings, and there's a feature in here where you can um, change the ethnicity of the hand clap or the thumb. But the default setting is to, like, the yellow Bart Simpson color, right? Like, in Adama, the default will always be blackness, right? Which is, um, you know, a remarkable opportunity that we have. Yeah. Um for me, uh, being a part of this was, was, I remember when Fahamu came to me with the idea, it was at, I think it was at a barbecue, we were talking and and um, it shifted my life as a curator. You know, at the time I was about to move to London and uh, as Heather was talking about this idea of the white gaze, I, I had set up my trip to go to London. I was gonna intern at, you know, and try to intern at the Tate Modern. And when, Adam, when Fahamu came with the concept, it really shifted something because for me as a millennial, it offered an opportunity for something that didn't exist. And so the thing that I wanted to do was educate myself. So I remember shifting my whole entire plans and then moving to South Africa for three months and just like exploring all the different museums and spaces there. And so for me, would it as a, as a curator, as someone who works in kind of um, the museum setting, uh, I hadn't seen anything that exists that really spoke to me, you know, and and didn't allow me the agency to kind of navigate and tell the stories I wanted to, you know, to to tell in the vernacular that I wanted, you know, to express it, right? And so, uh, what was interesting was uh, when I went to South Africa, I visited like Zeit Smoker and, and all these different museums and galleries, and they were having the same conversation, you know, on the continent, and so it just seemed so timely. Um, that Adamo could be a part of this moment where um, all over the world uh, institutions are kind of uh, erecting and being created that really want to take a thoughtful uh, engagement to the African diaspora. And so I think it's, for me, it just kind of shifted a lot. And so I, I want to be a part of it to to be also a part of history. Like I wanted to not just be a part of the diversity board of something or a part of the um, inclusionary programming for something. Uh, I wanted it to be something that you, you, you feel that is yours. You know, this is for you. So whatever you say and whatever you want, uh, we're just cultural custodians of, of that. You know, um, there's not a hierarchy in this, right? Everybody is, is it's like a brain trust, you know, everybody is valuable. So I think that's that's very powerful for me. But at the same time, because of that, we can't approach this in a way that we've ever approached it before. So it's there's also no kind of rule book uh, when you're doing something really culturally innovative and you're having to reimagine systematic things that didn't include us, you can't mimic and mirror things that already exist. So uh, in, in some ways it's like building a plane while it's still in the sky. Um, and so it's, it's scary, exciting, and amazing. <laughs> no, real talk, man. I, and I'm, and I'm, glad you, I'm glad you said that. I'm glad you uh, uh, brought that up, because that's a great uh, segue um, into, you know, the, the, the next sort of phase of this conversation. But to, 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 to piggyback on, on the term you use, cultural custodian, um, you know, I think one of the things that we've been very adamant about uh, in the crafting and the creating and the formation of Adama is that we didn't want to come across as the black, uh, uh, another black version of a white museum. Um, and this is something that, uh, you know, has been very, very, uh, um, I, I've, been, I've been very, very passionate about is how do we as a community, as African diasporic people, engage in quote-unquote art, right? Engage in this expression, engage in this uh, field of, of study, engage in this field of thought. How do, how do we do, right? Um, and 
the reason that this is important to me is because I think largely from my experiences, both an artist, as a curator, as a scholar, uh, I've experienced uh, the barriers, the self-imposed barriers that mm -hmm. Black people put on institutions, right? So largely, we're not necessarily the ones going to museums. We're not necessarily the ones going to these spaces. But that doesn't mean we're not interested in it or that we are not passionate about it. It's often, you know, sort of built into the actual systems and structures of these spaces where we're so conditioned to being barred from having access to these spaces that we don't even consider, right? Um, and we want Adama to be the complete opposite. Like, you know, if, if we can target that, 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 experience we could target that 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 part of us right uh, that wants to engage this space in a in in a unique and innovative way we can create a space that really becomes welcoming to our community that really becomes a haven uh for our community uh and not just you know as mike said uh where we appear as cultural custodians dictating to people what is culture we don't want to tell you we don't want to tell our community what the culture is. We want our community to tell us, and then we reflect it back. Y'all don't leave me hanging out here now. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I, 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 no. Not at all. No, I think, I think, I think you're totally right with that, and and I think that's one of the challenges. If I be real, as a curator, you face right. Some of the most amazing artists that I know tell me constantly, Michael, the people that I really want to reach don't see my work, right? Like, they're not coming to these spaces, right? They're, they're afraid of museums, they're, you know, galleries, these different spaces are unwelcoming to them. And so I think it's also interesting that uh, Adama not kind of having a physical space, it puts us in a posture where we have to go to people, right? So we don't have this, you know, we're not telling people to come to us, you know, we're saying we're coming to you we're already there when you're there, you know, we're there with you right now. And so um, I think that's also a, a really interesting thing because when you look at um, engagement, a lot of museums struggle with outreach. And so if you have a museum where the, where the museum is the outreach um, that is based in this idea of outreach, um, then I think it's, it's designed in a way to be very modular and, and mobile in a way that it can be um, where it needs to be. And I think that's very important um, in the structural uh, idea of Adama is, is, is what we're able to be, not just in Atlanta, but anywhere, you know, Cuba, South Africa, anywhere we need to be. So I think that to your point, um, even speaking to the idea of us not having at the time a physical structure um, puts a pressure and a thoughtfulness on us to really say, how are we visible without a structure that's visible? How can our cultural presence or collective presence be visible um, if we don't have a sign or a marquee that says Adama, how can people really know that presence is there? And I think that's a beautiful challenge. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think, you know, uh, and, and as, as, uh, um, as we continue to unpack that idea, you know, one of the, the the, the things that I, I, I've, I've sort of adopted, even in terms of like when I do my scholar thing, when I'm teaching, right? You know, the, the, my teaching philosophy essentially is that, uh, you know, knowledge is not about knowing the right answers, right? It's about knowing which questions to ask. And so this is, you know, at the core of any investigation, right? um, is about figuring out what questions to ask, right? Because it's in that discovery, it's in that uncovering, it's in that unpacking that we really begin to uh, advance ourselves and advance our uh, engagement beyond, you know, the surface, right? Beyond what is apparent and, and go deeper uh, in, in, into ideas, deeper into thought, deeper into expressions, deeper into presentations. I think that 
will make Adama even more impactful, more uh, uh, potent um, as mm -hmm. an institution. Yeah, I think I think you're right. Just about um, the interrogation of ideas being an ongoing uh, important core value of this of this venture because at the end of the day much of what we believe and think about art has been informed by whiteness in so many ways, right? And we would be foolish to think that we wouldn't succumb to some of those blind spots that come from that, even in our best intention to create uh, a cultural experience for uh, another audience. And so constantly interrogating and evaluating and investigating. And the fact that we're uh, starting off, as Mike said, in this virtual space, gives us an opportunity to bring a lot of people to the conversation um, and, and to allow that to inform whatever tangible thing this becomes or tangible things, because I don't think Adama will just be a piece of real estate. It will, it will exist uh, in the virtual world. It will be pop-up um, expressions. It will be, you know, in different languages. You know, that's one of the things that we've talked about um, as we've been doing the Salon series, right? We're a diasporic expression of art and um, you know our native tongue is English, like for the for the for the most of us. But you know we're we're in every part of the globe, speaking many languages. And how do we become an extension of that too? Um, so yeah, there's a there's a lot that we have to contend with and ponder through this exercise. Yeah, for sure. And I'm glad that you uh, mentioned that piece about um, being multilingual, um, because it you know again it, it, this this goes into the idea that uh, that Adama is is much broader um, in its scope than just you know the African American experience you know um, but we are a global destination and, and and it's imperative that you know that we not move from a space of um, uh, from a space of authority limitations you know that we have in terms of language in terms of uh, space in terms of uh, access and mobility right and so we're, we're you know as, as was stated in the uh, the, uh, the description of today's panel Adama is in the in the business of building bridges yeah. right um, and, and trying to make connections across the diaspora we, we, we are in Atlanta and we think it's important to be in Atlanta, but we're not just of Atlanta, right? We are, you know, um, we, 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 we are, uh, you know, really trying to live out the creed of everywhere we go, where we are. Um, and this is, it, for anyone who's ever traveled outside of the United States and, or, or even across the United States, you will find us everywhere at every level doing the same thing, essentially, you know what I mean? It might have a little tweak here, might have some different colors here, might have a different sound here, it might be in a different language here, but there's something, you know, to our blackness, to our African, out to our Africanity, to our DNA that connects us and connects us. And Adama is about finding ways to, to, to bring all of those different uh, uh, roots, those different arteries, uh, into one place where we can all feel a sense of home, feel a sense of connection, uh, and, and be able to grow and expand from that. Yeah. And, and that, what you're talking about, Fahamu, I wanted to just add something to that. That sense of connection mm -hmm. is one of the other aspects of Adama that I'm really excited about. Um, because not a lot of us, you know, do not have access to travel globally. And so you, you could live your whole entire life not knowing what you just talked about, that everywhere we go, there we are. Mm -hmm. And so I'm excited about creating um, a, an environment, physical, not non-physical, where um, young people have an opportunity to see themselves in the global context, in a, in a global African diaspora context, um, for that reason. And I also want to add, because I know that some people that are watching, there's been a lot of work behind the scenes culturally with the bridges. And I'm just going to give one example. Um, I think it was about this time last year, uh, we hosted a dinner 
uh, in Matanzas, uh, which is two hours out of Havana, Cuba. Um, and Matanzas uh, is a space where over a half a million West Africans were brought to work the sugar plantation. And it's a strong Afro-Cuban uh, population there. And so a part of it was uh, one of the ideologies that I engage with is human-centered design. And it starts with this idea of listening, right? Listening to understand. And so we started the dinner series where we would simply have a dinner and just listen to different people of the diaspora talk about these ideas and concepts. I think everything really has to start off with a very thoughtful conversation um, and holding space for people to have that conversation. So a few of the board members came out to Cuba. We sat down with artists ranging from 85 years old as young as 20 uh, uh, years old. And we had a beautiful conversation um, about ways we can engage and think about projects. And so from that, um, different things have already been birthed and second visits have happened. And so that's one of the things I just wanted to put out there because I know sometimes uh, as a board, executive board, uh, one thing, we're our working board. So we're, we're, we're really working and engaging. Um, and so that was just something that I think uh, the famous curator in Paris coined the phrase of relational art. And I love that idea because relational art is that, you know, in the South, we do it all the time. On Sundays when we eat food, relational artists just sitting there talking to people, engaging in, in, in the oral tradition of us telling stories. And so that has been one of our kind of cultural tools as we're navigating. Before we can, you know, as Baham was saying before, be custodians or say what the culture is, we're right now listening, listening to people saying what's missing, what's absent in the spaces that you're going to, what's absent um, in the cultural engagement that you want to be fulfilled with. And then from there, we can meet the civic need. And I think what happens sometimes is certain museums and spaces really don't have the time or really thoughtful interest to really understand the civic need of people that look like us. And so because we have that space, we're starting from a space of listening. And then from there, we can develop something that can be thoughtful and most importantly, that can be sustainable because so many spaces have these diversity moments and these moments where you feel like it's something, you know, for the culture, but there's no sustainability. It looks really beautiful in photos and end of the year reports, um, but it's not really something that has a uh, true lasting power. Um, and so we're thinking about this idea of lasting power. Um, so I just wanted to. Yeah, no, no, real talk, man. And, you know, I think, um, you know, that, that, that goes to one of the questions that I, I saw in the in the chat here. I'm gonna try to get back to it. Yeah, it was, it was going kind of fast. I was like, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, the question was, how do we plan to implement and demonstrate a true valuing of our supporters and attendees who come to these virtual discussions? Um, which I think is a great question, but the, 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 the answer is almost in the question. Like, you know, a part of creating this um, series, um, the Adama Art Salon, uh, was about being able to create real time, um, a, a, a responsive space for us to engage the diasporic community um, at, at large. Uh, you know, as you may have noticed, if you've been tuning in the last eight weeks, um, with the exception of one panel, um, all of the panels have been uh, uh, attendees, the moderators have been from sister institutions, right? Uh, and, and independent uh, curators and thinkers. And a part of the thinking in that was Adama is not an island, right? Mm -hmm. We're not reinventing, we're not inventing the wheel. We're, you know, we're, we're trying to modify the design somewhat, right? But we, we know that we exist in a continuum, in a continuum, as does all of our uh, uh, cultural practices. We are building on those that have come before. Um, and so in some ways, this is, you know, uh, you know very traditional sort of, of African uh, concepts of, of building from our community. Um, the concept of Ubuntu in, in South Africa, which means I am because of us. Um, and so by engaging these other spaces, by engaging these other 
leaders at other institutions by engaging these other independent scholars and thinkers and artists and, 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 and curators and having them come in and be a part of the programming that Adama is doing. We're able to now uh, not only hear from our partner institutions and sister institutions, but we're also able to build from their wisdom and experience uh, in the practices and, and things that they've been doing. Um, and so I think one of the ways we're trying to do that, and it, you know, like Mike said, is by listening. But the other way is by engaging our elders uh, and, and, and really being able to borrow from their experience and their input. I think not to mention also being the backdrop for Black liberation. Like that's an important through line that, you know, doesn't exist in other institutions, right? You know, it is identity, you know, uh, uh, providing avenues for exploring identity within the express purpose of, um, you know, resistance and liberation. That's what, you know, that's what art does. <clears throat> and I think the way that we do art these days, particularly from an institutional standpoint, is to, to placate the masses, you know, to stand at a distance and look at pretty pictures and then check that off their list that they did their cultural thing. And then they go about the way of exploiting people. Um, whereas I think this is just to stir and ignite and agitate yeah. uh, towards the common good. Yeah. Uh, you're gonna burn some shit. <laughs> there was a um a, also a, a, a question about um if we're going to bridge to elder black people who are not artists, curators, or even professionals. And I wanted to talk about that a little bit because that's real important to me, especially now that I'm a grandmother. <laughs> is um working uh, across generations. I just think that's absolutely critical. Um, going back to something that Mike said, that if, if it doesn't exist, you can't mimic it or you can't replicate it. Um, it's really important to me, and I know that uh, other board members feel this way too, that um, we think about this as something that, like, that, that will last for generations. We're not just creating something for, for, for us, you know, who can enjoy it right now and, 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 and make use of it now. This is something that we expect to live even after we're all gone. I was thinking about um, the questions that we were going to address today in the conversation um, and what, what art means to me. And what I thought about is um, Egyptian art. Hmm. And how when I went to um, see the Egyptian art exhibit at the Brooklyn Museum for the first time, the thing that really struck me was um, uh, actual hair, braided hair, they had, you know, <laughs> pieces of braided hair and um, paintings of mothers braiding cornrows into their daughter's hair, Egyptian mothers. And I, I had a moment, I thought, that's me, that's what I do. And if not for that art, I wouldn't know that thousands of years ago, BC, my mother's 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 mother was doing this same um, artistic expression in her daughter's hair that create that that uh, reaffirms our bond over millennia. Like that's amazing to me, and I and I feel like Adama has the the possibility of that, the potential of that. So that thousands of years from now, someone, some young woman, some some daughter, some mother will see herself and say, "Okay, we we've been here," you know. So this is not for just for us now. This is for forever, as far as I'm I'm concerned. So I just want to talk about that cross generational thing. Yeah. No, I, 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 I love that too, because it, it, it underscores something else that I think is essential um, to our understanding. Um, you know, even when we say, like with the Dhamma, that everywhere we go, there we are, that doesn't just mean like physically, right? Mm -hmm. You know, like we're talking everywhere we go through time, mm -hmm. there we are. Right, you know, our, our past, present, future is all one and the same, which is why it's super essential that we engage our elders um, and that we engage uh, uh, aspects of our community that are not necessarily versed 
uh, in the arts um, because we're all connected, regard regardless of if we see those connections or not. But what Adama hopes to underscore is those connections, is, is to be able to, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, connect us in ways that affirm our humanity, essentially at the core of what art does, right? Um, art is an affirmation of who we are. It's, 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 a, it's a record of who we are. You know, I, I always say in the future, historians will tell what happened, but artists will tell how it felt. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, there's nowhere in, you know, in the history of art that you do not see the connections that tie human beings together. And I don't care what that art is. It could be paintings, it could be music, it could be poetry, it could be dance, it could be theater, it could be whatever. But it's about telling our stories, it's about presenting us, it's about humanizing us uh, in ways that, that go on long beyond our physical existence. And, and I think also to speak to that is that you talked about the idea of like, um, I think language is important, right? And so I know sometimes people hear creative or artist, and sometimes they can feel excluded. And so it's interesting because I was thinking about today for the talk, I was like a curator, right? And by its basic definition, the curator is a custodial of a collection, permanent collection, right? And so everyone has that person in their family, right? That always takes pictures that your grandma like, please don't put me on Facebook. And <laughs> When somebody passes away, this is the person that you call because you need the pictures for the slideshow. So that's the other thing is, as a diamond, we have to demythify these cultural titles. Like, a curator is auntie that has that album book that has your birth certificate and social security, and she know you're going to lose it even though you're 30 years old, and you still can call her to get it. So that's another thing, too. Um, and then secondly, the word diaspora, I was looking up with Marion Webster, is kind of displacement or scattering from a person's homeland. And so even as, as, as people are watching, a lot of us migrated from different spaces. So when we're talking about our diaspora, that's you reaching out to your cousins in Georgia or your auntie in Mississippi and connecting in that way. And so I think that one of the things that's really powerful in art and cultural practice is how do I apply this in my daily life? And I hear people sometimes leave museums and spaces. They're like, this is beautiful, but how does this work on me? How do I apply this? And I think that when you're thinking about the diaspora, you can think about your own diaspora. What places have I ascended and scattered from? What places have I migrated and went to? How could I go into the cultural memory and ancestral memory of that? How many people that are watching this, you have certain personality traits, and then your grandma says, well, your auntie was just like that, and it brings the comfort to you because now you know that there's this ancestral link that you're tethered to people that are part of your diaspora. And so I think that's the other thing is how do we make the language in what's happening very like, not so much tangible, but just real in a kind of folklore type of way. And so I want everyone listening to know you're empowered that these cultural roles have already been existing. Like, we, we already do this. When we talk about relational art, that's the cookout. That's you hanging out with your family. You know what I mean? When, you, when we talk about uh, meal prep, that was Thanksgiving when you was had to eat the same food for a week because you hosted it. So you know, these are things that we've already been doing. And I think the biggest thing that's powerful, and Heather spoke about before, before is that we don't have to speak to the white gaze. So now we're not having to translate all we're, what we're trying to do is transform and actually tell people to relax and know that what we're talking about, you already do. Mm -hmm. All we're doing is, is excavating the things that you already do. We're not engaging with something outside of you. And I think sometimes with art, that's what really happens. Art works on you um, it and it can work on you in a very slow way. So uh, I think sometimes even when I talk to students, they're like, man, I just don't get it. And it's just like a song you listen to. I didn't understand Bag Lady, and I love the beat forever. And I hit like 25, and I was like, oh, Bag Lady, that's what she means. Oh, baggage. Okay, and it just hit me. But it, it meant even more to me because I didn't get it before, but I was experiencing it. And I think that there also has to be a certain type of patience in this process that the way that art and culture works on you isn't this microwave, instantaneous way. It's going to take its time. And the truth is, 
Adama may not even see the fruits of how these talks resonate with you because it may not awaken into you for two or three years. And then you go back to this conversation and you're like, oh, I remember when I first heard that. And so I think that's another big part of it is like us as a diaspora being patient with ourselves and patient in the process, but also to empower ourselves to know that the things that we're speaking about, we already do. There may be language and vernacular behind it and pedagogy around it, but we're already doing it in our everyday lives. And so take that as an empowerment to the cultural things that you're already doing, you know? Can I talk a little bit about um, the, the, the gays? I gotta admit that um, I, I, I understand the, the concept and know that it's real. I, I feel fortunate that in my life, it, I, I did not acknowledge that, I didn't need to acknowledge that there was a white gay, kind of like, is there really one? But that's just, I know that's my, <laughs> this is my experience. Um, but what I've loved about the panels, the Adama panels, is that they've reminded me that sometimes we can get caught up in our North American westernized days on the rest of the world. And I've appreciated hearing from curators and artists who from the African diaspora who are in other parts of the, of the world, other parts of the planet and hearing, having a dialogue with them and hearing how they perceive us and how they perceive what, how, how we can connect and commune with them from their perspective, that's been really enlightening for me. And so that's another thing about Adama's work that I'm really looking forward to doing more of. Um, my husband and I were really fortunate to have, Kim and I were really fortunate to have an opportunity to, for him to perform and play in Cuba. And one of the things that really like struck us was first just that it's, it's a black country. <laughs> it's just black people who just happen to speak Spanish. So that was the first thing we were like, oh, okay. Um, and, but the other thing was that in, in talking with the Cuban people and the Cuban artists, when we would say things like, you know, well, well can we have a conversation about Afro-Cuban jazz? They would say, What's, that's, not, that's not a legit thing, it's African music. And so they explained to us how the music that they're playing really is Yoruba or, you know, and it is just African rhythm slowed down or, or tempoed up but that they consider it African music. Or when we would call ourselves African-Americans, they would say, what do you mean? You're just African people. You're just in a different um, geography. You're just in a different, like you're just in a different zip code. We're all African people, we're your cousins. We're the same people that are in Jamaica, that are in Brazil, that are in, you know. And that was a, intellectually, I think we knew, we knew that, but it was a whole different level of like, aha moment for us having that conversation with when i say black cuban people i mean blue black cuban people telling us you don't know how black you are we're, we're, we're blacker than you we're at more african than you you've got this disconnected so i think through having this um global conversation we hear uh people of african descent living here in the western hemisphere in north america have an opportunity for us to learn more and get more in touch with who we really are so this is a um, a conversation that goes both ways. Yeah, that's a, a, a powerful sentiment too, because uh, again, the a, a part of the challenge I think that we have, especially when we start thinking about institutions of Black culture, um, is you know, so often we are forced to negotiate our blackness in spaces, right? How do I shrink my blackness so that I don't offend people? How do I, you know, uh, mask my blackness so that nobody shoots me when I'm walking down the street? How do I, you know, bend and sway and flex and do these acrobatics, right? To get through the world in our, in, in, in our black, so, so much so that to your point in like, Black Americans often take on, you know, the, the, the guise of Americanness, right? Um, the sort of privilege that comes with Americanness. Uh, and then you're quickly reminded, you know, nah, you're just Black. You know what I'm saying? But there's no such thing as just Black, because Black is so powerful, right? So what we're doing with Padama is 
you know, in bringing and building these bridges and connecting us across these different uh, spaces and and highlighting and and and, and uh, 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 um, showcasing um, the the connections that we have and showing that everywhere we go that we are, we're taking off, you know, some of this stuff. We're disrobing from some of these like shortcomings that we've come to accept or that we've been conditioned to believe. Um, and in doing so, it's like a metamorphosis, right? We become even po even more powerful. And that little boy who lives in, you know, Bankhead, who's never left his neighborhood, who walks into a dama and sees a little black boy, sees an image of a black boy in Botswana that looks just like him, that's doing some of the same things that he's doing, begins to see himself reflected in a space that he never imagined himself going before. You know, imagine how that changes his worldview. Imagine how that changes his his uh, perception of himself, right? Um, and so Adama is, is not just about, it's not a museum just about art for art's sake, right? We're, we're, we're about, like I said, we're, we're in the business of building bridges to elevate us and to transform us beyond where we thought we even were. Even. And asking questions. And asking asking questions. questions. Yeah. And making connections. So, uh, you know, let me see if we're missing anything in our agenda. Oh, I did want to uh, just speak a little bit about maybe some of the things that we've uh, learned in the uh, uh, Adama Art Salon series. And, and Aisha, you kind of touched on that a little bit uh, with your last uh, comment. Um, but I, I, I do think that, you know, this was this is a great sort of point. You know, we've had uh, over the last eight weeks, we've had seven, this is the seven. Uh, salon uh, that we've done, and, you know, we've had some really, really powerful conversations. I mean, every Sunday has been like going to church, um, you know, just hearing from some of these, like some, some of the folks who are just super, super brilliant, um, and uh, who, again, like, as Mike pointed out, are having the same conversations that we have amongst our board, or, or that we have amongst our peer groups. Um, and so it's been really interesting to see these these conversations play out. But I just want to ask you guys so any impressions that you've had, any any moments or any uh, things that you've heard in the salon that surprised you, that uh, uh, that uh, uh, encouraged you or put you even more um, towards you know your thinking about Adama, like anything that has come up in the conversation that's really been powerful and impactful to you. I, I would say just the series in of itself, in terms of creating an affinity space for us to have these conversations has been really important and is really driving home for me how important it is going forward, particularly as folks become increasingly more interested in things like diversity and equity and inclusion, that oftentimes those conversations happen in multiracial spaces. And then we as the black folks in those conversations are often catering to the interest and sudden awakening of the other people. And we rarely, rarely, rarely ever have the opportunity just amongst ourselves to just interrogate our complicity in so much of the trauma and tragedy that we've experienced in this country in particular. Um, uh, what we can do about it, uh, grieve about it, just without having to always protect the vulnerabilities in those spaces, particularly white folks in the room. like. To just have that with ourselves, I think, has been really powerful because it means that we can start the conversation here and move forward as opposed to having to go all the way back here and get people to a place where they can just at least quasi admit to what the challenges are. Mm. Um, so I've really appreciated that. And that has just been uh, such a, an eye opening experience just for me and how I want to uh, continue in, in my work separate from Adama. One of the things that was just so um, um, moving and like affirming for me is when I was promoting the panels, getting emails from parents saying that they were using them at, uh, for homeschooling, using the panels as homeschooling. Um, sometimes you do things or you're part of something, you think that, that the outcome is going to be this one thing, this vision over here, and then there's something else that happens that really kind of blows your mind. And so that that was... Awesome. That actually made me cry a little bit, a little bit. like, wow, okay, this is bigger than I thought even uh, it was going to be, uh, just the panels. Um, but, but personally, 
I think I've just, I've actually been um, sparked creatively. Um, I have always loved Lisa Butler's work. Mm -hmm. And I, I was like having a fangirl moment during that salon. I was like, I can't believe she's on here. You know, like, with a lot of the artists, I'm just like for clipped. Um, but um, so I actually got a sewing machine. It's right there. And um, my daughter and I, like, <laughs> we got some fabric, you know. <laughs> so like, um, we've been like, you know, trying to do our own art here at home since we've been um, sheltering in place. So it's, it's, uh, it's just been really inspiring, actually. I want to second that. It was, it's definitely been very inspiring. I also think that it just, confirm that we were on the right track based on the conversations that you know these are things that you know just by creating the space we've le I've learned so much from the various artists that have been on and the you know the the Q&A's that have come up I mean but it definitely has sparked a creative space within and I think that that's been a huge takeaway. Something that you're right was something that I didn't expect to happen, but it's definitely happened. Mike, you got anything? You still there, Mike? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it, yeah, it's, it's been it's been amazing, man. Like, and I don't know if I'm with when you started, it was like one. Because I think it's always interesting when like when you do something and then people get so excited about it. Like people are hit, you know, calling me as if I have like VIP tickets to get to it. They're like, so who's gonna be on the next one? Like one to know early who what the next one's gonna be. Um <laughs> it's, it's crazy when it goes full circle and people are like, Hey man, have you you know, that may not know I'm on the board, it's like, do you know about this is going on? This is amazing. And it's like to me, that's powerful because the the, the people, the attendees, going back to one of the questions about how do we empower it, like, it's value in it, right? Like, people have to show up. You don't have to log on. So I think it's also this space where you can be doing anything else. And so you're engaging. And to be honest, even when I go to Art Talks, I don't get to, like, see people share their screen and show different aspects of their process. And, like, I was just so inspired by, like, people being able to really talk about the yeah. details in their work and... And just seeing the, the artists, you know, kind of fan out over each other and be excited about each other. Like, you, it, it, it almost feels like, man, this is, this is like, I shouldn't be witnessing, you know, you know, it's just, it just, it's just an amazing thing. So, like I said, sometimes the structure in these spaces of art talks, you can't really have that fluidity. Like Heather was saying, you have to start from this certain space to get people to a point and then you have the conversation. And within you, with, with, with this, you could just go into the thick of it and, yeah, it's been powerful, man. And I go back and watch it on YouTube and um uh and I'm taking notes. I'm like, man, I didn't know this person thought this way and stuff like that. And so that's also the thing too, is I'm always interested in the humanity of artists. I think sometimes with museums, they they kind of dehumanize. You just know their work, you know, you know, their how much their work is worth and how many shows they have. But when you're hearing people talking about their children and you know the cats and dogs and what they ate this morning and things like that, things like that just humanize people to a level that makes you feel more engaged with them. And so for me, that's what I look forward to is like, you know, how was your day today? Or like, what things are you dealing with in your personal life or everyday life? And so I think that's just a layer because sometimes the art world creates this kind of like private tintedness of what you have to show. It's been really like, I feel like after the talk, you feel like these people are your cousin. Like if I see them out, on the street, I'm be like, hey, what up? I, I was at the talk. I didn't notice about you. And so, you know, uh, you know, it's just been amazing. Man. So I, I'm excited. Can I say something about that, Mike? I think that is so important what you said about like these these uh, conversations when you leave, you feel like they're your family or your cousin because of what you said earlier about if it doesn't exist, you can't mimic it. So the next generation, if they can, if they see a salon and say, Oh, I can relate to this. This that person could be my. It could be my cousin. Yeah. Then they're seeing the, the the possibilities for themselves in that person, right? It doesn't feel so far removed removed from you, as it often does sometimes when you go into a museum. You know, you see these these you know big amazing pieces of art on the wall, but you don't feel any connection to the person who made it. You don't even oftentimes 
get to see or know who the person you just see the name on the on the little card so right. i think that's really powerful what you what you said that the the impact of what these salons can have and you take them into your sacred space right it's interesting that when i talk to a lot of artists i say man what inspired you to be an artist and 50 percent of the answers i get are comic books or books or these kind of material objects that they're able to take into their own private space and i love museums but sometimes when you go there you have a guard telling you not to touch the artwork and don't get too close and you have somebody behind you and you want to act like you're thinking all deep and really reading and you know, so you're trying to perform when you're there right you know you all know how people would either have a hand behind their back and you know lean in like oh that's beautiful what do you see and it's like i don't know what i see you know what i mean so um but with the zoom it's like you're in your you know you're in your pajamas you know what i mean i can eat my chips and hear you talk and you know put my headset in and still go to the restroom and still hear you talk and it's like there's a comfort and I think there's a, a, a taking off of armor that we have to wear so many times uh, that the conversation, I think, engages with you at a different level. And so that's what I love, too, is just like you, you can tune in, you cannot tune in. But but when you do, I feel like you really get something of value in the people that come. Uh, every every person that's been a part of these panels, man, they they being there their whole selves. And that's another thing too, is so many times you're policed on what you can talk about or how much of yourself you can bring or what things you could talk about. And I feel like it, this creates a space where people can bring their full humanity. And a lot of times there's not even spaces that we have like that, sometimes even within our family or in our workplace, where we can really bring our entire selves to the table. Um, and that as just a human practice, I think is powerful. Cause I've been seeing like Zoom birthday parties and all type of things that people are doing, and it's it's been really amazing. So yeah, yeah, real talk, man. Thank you. Uh, that that was a great, uh, that was a, a a beautiful way to 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 you know again sort of like talk about why a space like Adama is important and why even spaces like these virtual spaces are are important um, because they do allow us to to make those connections in, in meaningful ways. Like last week's panel, I, I wasn't prepared for, for what happened to me emotionally, man. Those uh, four powerful, amazing uh, women artists, they were so vulnerable, so honest, so open, so giving. Um, and uh, I, I have to say that the thing that, that I, I haven't been able to stop thinking about it, but when Makiba um, asked the question last week of the, of the panel, what do you want your legacy as an artist to be in 250 years, 500 years, whatever? And they first laughed, you know, at the question, like, man, that's a lot to think about, you know? But Ebony Patterson said something that, man, I, I mean, it just, it rocked me to my core. She said, I hope in a hundred years that the work that I'm doing is no longer relevant. Mm. Wow. Like that was powerful to me um, because, you know, it, it, as an artist whose, whose work is rooted in this conversation of affirming our humanity and, and rooted in this conversation of saving us and, and you know, acknowledging us, right? Um, yeah, in a hundred years, why? I, I don't want to be doing, you know what I mean? Like, I don't want that to still be the story, that someone has to do the work to affirm our humanity, right? And so a space like Adama becomes a, 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 a weapon in that war, right? Uh, you know, where the humanity of, of African diasporic people is not only uh, presented through the art, it's affirmed by the the installation of the space that a space like this exists so that people who um from around the world will be able to engage uh with us and be able to see us right and so much of the work that a lot of black artists are, are doing is about making us visible um and and you know we we have to uh, it, it's, it's a shame that we we still have to advocate for our visibility but if we're gonna do it, let's do it in a way that doesn't have to 
uh, bow down to anybody else, that we don't have to put on airs for anybody else, where we can go and we can be just like we're being every week in these panels, where if you need to cry, you can cry. You know, if you want to laugh, you can laugh. If you want to learn, you can learn. If you want to grow, you want to grow, right? We want, we want to create a space like that. So Fahamu, there are a couple of questions in the Q&A, mostly related to the future, what's expected for the remainder of 2020, uh, questions around programming. So if you wanted to just sort of address that. Yeah, well, I, I will say, you know, the, a, a part of what we're doing now is still asking those questions, right? Like, you know, uh, and this is a true story. The Adama Art Salon series really sort of just kind of happened. It wasn't something that we were necessarily planning. It wasn't how we were planning to introduce ourselves publicly. It wasn't planning. It wasn't uh, anything that we were um, really, uh, you know, uh, very deliberate about at the onset. We just saw an opportunity to engage our community uh, because everybody was quarantined and you know forced indoors. Um, and so we figured, well, you know, here's an opportunity to, you know, do something, right, uh, and bring people together. And it's really grown and evolved out of that. Uh, you know, now, I mean, I have, I, I will, I, I will share this with our audience since, since people are kind of, you know, like chiming in and seeing the comments. People are like, I check in every Thursday to see who's who's up. So this week, uh, uh, next week, I mean, uh, our guest will be uh, Dr. Deb Willis. Uh, in conversation with um, Andrea Barnwell Brownlee from the Spelman Museum. And so that's going to be an amazing conversation because anybody who knows anything about Dr. Deb Willis, you know that she is a force uh, uh, in the Black arts community, um, you know, and, and, and not just uh, amongst African American artists, but globally, she's a force um, educator, uh, artist, scholar. Um, she does it all. Uh, and I'm, I'm really excited to be able to essentially sit at her feet and learn more about her journey and about her, uh, her work and the work that she continues to do. Um, but in terms of what we're doing with the Dhamma, in, in, in terms of our programming, uh, as a result of these uh, panels, we've been able to build bridges with other institutions across the, the country and across the globe um, who are interested in collaborations with us and partnerships with us. Uh, I've begun uh, conversations with the Houston Museum of African American Contemporary Art. Um, uh, yesterday, I uh, uh, had a conversation with the, uh, the board chair and the director of Mokata in Brooklyn. And everyone is like, how can we all work together? How can we build bridges and, and, and create experiences and opportunities? And so, you know, as we continue to roll out, we'll continue with the Adama Art Salon because it's been an invaluable um, uh, piece of, of our story, especially as we, you know, endeavor to, to ask questions, right? And to be responsive uh, to our community. Um, we'll continue to do this programming, but, uh, you know, as uh, our next major initiative will be our own capital campaign. Um, so that we can begin to do more, we can begin to present exhibitions, we can uh, begin to, you know, uh, travel our uh, programs and, and, and ideas to other parts of the diaspora, uh, and, and, and really be able to, again, to be flexible, to be responsive, um, and to be responsible with the weight of what we're, what, what we're building here. You know, um, you know there, there have been other organizations and other arts institutions and other individuals who have, you know, uh, tried to create spaces that are supposed to speak for and about the African diaspora and, you know, somewhere along the, the way they lose their footing or they, you know, go awry or they, you know, become interested in something else and, you know, they drop the ball. We're, we don't plan to drop the ball. Yeah. Uh, y'all, y'all just like to leave me hanging. Actually. No, no, no. We, no. <laughs> yeah. and, 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 and like I, like Fahmu was saying, I think the these talks, these panels, act as kind of a as a tool, like a really way to kind of understand and listen. And, and so, um, also, we've been talking to institutions abroad as well. And so, I think that um, 
of course, with everything going on with COVID as well, it's just like, it's a moment of stillness, a, a very a, a thoughtfulness and reflection. And so, um, you know, also feel free to email us if you have, you know, ideas or you have interesting intersections. That's the thing too, is that I think so many times, even with certain institutions, there's so many walls, you like, we're accessible, man. Like DM for Hamu, he, he asks for uh, DMs. <laughs> so, you know, feel free to slide his DM at any time and, you know, he'll respond to you, email, email anybody on here. Uh, you know, and that's the thing too, it's just like, it has to be a participatory model. Um, and uh, I love the idea of participatory. If you go to like a carnival, the moment you're in a carnival, you're a part of it, right? So if you're in here, you're a part of it now. So it's like, uh, it, it's as good as we make it. And so, uh, so that is a open call for, you know, if you have proposal or ideas, you know, please submit them and engage with us on that. Um, because I think also, even with COVID, we're thinking about social distancing and intentionality. I think programming, what programming is going to look like after this. I think everyone has to reimagine what programming looks like in the physical space, right? And so I think my, my idea is, you know, 21 days to form a habit, people are going to really be thoughtful about the places that they go, right? So we have to be very intentional about if we're going to do something, is, are, are we really being safe? Are we really being thoughtful? So those are other things that we're taking measures on um, and just kind of being thoughtful in that. But, uh, but yeah, please, you know, please feel free to, to engage with us with, you know, ideas and concepts that you have, um, you know, feedback, good or bad, whatever, you know, I think that that's important as well. Um, that we have to create a space of transparency and openness. Um, and so that's just something that, to be honest, I've sat on different boards, but I haven't sat on the board like this. Uh, and so it's just, even the people, I'm learning stuff today from some of the, you know, the board members. I was like, man, I didn't know that, and this and that. And so it's beautiful and it's an everyday learning experience. So again, I just wanna also take time to thank everybody who has been along this journey. Um, and it's been amazing. It's amazing reading your comments and your insights. So I'm trying to do both. So yeah. Um, I wanted to address or at least acknowledge, because uh, I don't know that I, I have the answer, but um, acknowledge the question from Imara about funding. How has funding been? And Fahamu touched on it a little bit, but I think to Mike's um, note about how everyone has to rethink programming, I think everyone has to rethink um, funding and fundraising strategy uh, to support that programming because how you engage with donors and potential donors is going to be different now. And so we're, we're all going to have to be creative and innovative about how we raise money for, for this too. But I'd love to talk to you more about that some more. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, we don't want to pander to like white liberals to support black institutions and deny black folks the opportunity to support and be the sustaining source for their own institutions. You know, I said, you know, as a person who does fundraising professionally, like that's oftentimes the conversation. It's like, who are the rich white people that we know? And we deny a lot of us the opportunity to participate. And it's because the fundraising will look different in those models. And so Adama also has the opportunity to create some new models um, that aren't predicated on white liberal guilt. Because that, <laughs> that's not productive. Yeah. It always dies. No, not at all. It only pay so long. Your money only pays for so long. Yeah, and the minute you do something of like relevance and urgency, that's when the, the money gets gone. I'm actually in the middle of a fundraising campaign right now. Um, and one of the things that has really, um, I guess, just been made so clear to us it, for another institution, a pub, another public institution, is that the $5 and $10 monthly gifts, those are the things that are sustaining us right now because the big, huge checks that we would typically get, um, you know, a lot of them have disappeared. Right. Yeah. So that community-based funding model, um, it can really work, especially in times like this where, um, you know, people are out of work and economic yeah. systems well, are- And just that, and just that notion that, community and charity is only an exercise of the rich is, you know, that needs to be 
we we need to do away with that you know yeah, it needs to be dismantled you know, community investment that is that is an exercise and opportunity give, that we afford to everybody to be part of something bigger than themselves Absolutely. not just the elite in one percent yeah and I, I think to that point the subscription model offers um kind of this passive way to give but it also it's a dynamic way to ask, you know, for the person supporting, is this giving me what I want, right? And so sometimes the idea of like I give annually versus like, man, this is value. You know, someone that says, hey, I use this as homeschooling for my children. I'm going to keep subscribing to this programming, you know, and, and I think that model is very powerful uh, on both sides. I think that if, if, if whatever organization has to be very thoughtful about everything that they're engaging with and it can't be kind of off season in that situation. Um, you know, y'all know when you watch stars, some of y'all only get stars when, when power is on. And as soon as it's on, y'all subscribe, right? And so, power is in your stars in their, in their power to keep you there. Like, 299, we'll bring it down. You sure? We'll give you six. And so, as crazy as that is, that business model, just that, you know, as you were speaking about the, the, the white guild of philanthropy of like, you know, to be honest, a lot of those giving models don't give to innovation they give to sustain they give to safeness but when you're talking about innovative uh unrestricted ideas a grant writer has to learn how to write grants every year because the grant portal changes you know so you have people so busy trying to learn how to grant write that they're not even having time to deal with operational costs or you're trying to shrink your idea to make it happen in this in this portion that should probably be a, a, a talk within itself of like how are we reimagining understanding our value and seeing us as an investment. You need, you know, this is something my past experience. Uh, I worked at this university um, at, at the art gallery there and the carving back to art gallery. And we got a loan letter from every major institution. I'm talking Harvard, Princeton, uh, the MoMA. And so what we saw was their permanent collection didn't have, the African diaspora art that they that they needed, so they were having these loan agreements. And it was a moment that I saw, wow, there's a value. We, have, I think, institutionally, culturally, have to understand that. What is our value, and how are we negotiating and navigating that? But going back to Heather's model, it's just like how are we supporting that? And for some of y'all wondering why I have a hat on, is because my barber is not up and running yet, and that's a that is a <laughs> subscription entrepreneur model that you talk about pure, beautiful entrepreneurship and sacred space, the barbershop and the beauty salon. One of our board members, I saw a post on her Instagram, that outside of seeing her family, the first thing she can't wait to do is go to her salon appointment. And so there's also these cultural innovations that, we're already, that, are, that are already happening when we think about how can we have sustainable funding from, from everybody that's watching if that's a dollar two dollars but on the other side is are we really giving you something of value um that is pushing things further and so uh that's what we need your feedback on that so. and i think that's the question right is what do you value right um because you know for for anybody out there who says you know uh I can't afford to go on a trip to, you know, London, but, you know, you're buying $400 sneakers every month. You know what I'm saying? It's like the things that you value, you'll find a way to invest in. Um, and, you know, this isn't a, 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 a way of like shaming anybody for how you choose to spend your money. But, you know, what we want to do with Adama is create a space that, you feel uh, supports you and represents you and that you will feel comfortable investing in. You will feel comfortable in supporting. You will feel comfortable in bringing your family to. You will feel comfortable in going to exhibitions for or going to a concert or reading or whatever it may be. Whatever we're doing, you know that it's a space that you can go and that you're gonna get something from, right? And so whatever you wanna give, if that's $5, $1, whatever, you, you know, it's an investment that you're willing to make because you know you're going to get something back from it. So, you know, ultimately the question is, what do you value? And when you value something, you find ways to support it. Yeah. What's is essential? It, What's essential? When they say essential, what is essential to you? 
Because I don't know about everybody else. I've saved a lot of money. A lot of money I've saved in this time because a lot of stuff I was buying was not essential. Yeah. And I was like, what have I been spending my money on? Because the only place I go is to the grocery store. And I'm very thoughtful about that. So I even have to think, do I really need, you know, this or that? So essential is, you know, it's, it's an interesting time to think about the things you value and the things that are essential to you in your daily life. There's an interesting conversation in the chat um, about whether there is space for white engagement. <laughs> I, got, I got my thoughts. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm going I'm to say this, and I think that it's important, right? You know, because okay. oftentimes when, when, when we hear people start talking about something that is Black-centric or has Blackness at the center of it, you know, uh, people who are non-Black start to feel isolated or excluded from that. Um, Adama is not about excluding anybody. It's, it's really about just affirming us, right? Um, and so if you're white, if you're whatever, and you want to support, support. Like, you know, it's, there's no reason that you, you're, you're white and you can't support Adama. It's just like the two don't cancel each other out. I do think the fundamental difference, though, in this conversation is just the priority. Mm -hmm. and the consideration. I, I don't think white folks are a priority and a consideration in this space, but they are welcome, as you said, to participate and support. And with that participation needs to come a type of respect and deference because it is not about you. Mm -hmm. And the exercise of learning those things that you don't know <laughs> is the onus of that is on you, said white person with the infinite possibilities of the internet to educate and inform you, not those in the said space. You know what I mean? And so I think, I think it's a really great opportunity to shape and mold the posturing of white folks in a uh, black centered space. Mm -hmm. um, that the, the center of the cultural sweet spot here is not you. And that you enter it with a, a kind of deliberate uh, respect and um, you know, position in the back of the room. You know, get comfortable with the back of the room. The front can of I, the room is taken. Can I share a funny? Don't question? put your hand up either. Don't put your hand up. Collect <laughs> your phone. You know, do a Google search. But you know, find 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 stillness and peace in the back of the room. I want to share a really quick funny story um, about that. Um, when I was a little girl, I, as I mentioned earlier, I grew up in the nation. And you know, our dress code is that you cover your hair, uh, at least, especially growing up, you know, everybody had their hair covered. And I went to um, Claire Muhammad schools, which were schools where all, you know, all the kids in my community, Muslim community went to. And so we had little Tams and our hair was covered and our teachers all had their hair covered. And um, one day I was in the bathroom and one of my teachers was in the bathroom too. And she took off her scarf to like adjust her hair or wash up for prayer or something. And when she took her scarf off, I gasped because I didn't realize that she was white. Her hair was, was blonde and straight. I saw the face, I saw the, the, the pale skin every day, I saw the blue eyes, but I never in my mind <laughs> imagined that she was Caucasian <laughs> because she was, embedded in the culture, in the practices, in, the, it, it, in all ways of us being the kind of black people we were in, in the community I grew up in, anybody who was white in that space, they, they were blended in with the rest of us. So that's where, not that I'm saying that, that white people can't be white in a, in a black space, but there is a way to be supportive where you're not disruptive. And I think that's what I would invite and encourage, uh, you know, white people or all people who are participating, you know, who want to be a part of this journey with us is just engage. The fact that you're here, the fact that you're asking the question, I think is, is wonderful and, and exciting. I think that's a great first step. Just ask the question, how can I be of service? That's a great start right there. And, then, and I think to your point too, just engage, right? You know what I mean? Like, I think so often 
people come with their own preconceived ideas and their own, you know, sort of uh, prejudices about what a space is, um, that you, you are no longer able to actually engage with what's going on. You're looking for yourself uh, in this space. And when you don't see yourself, then it's, it becomes problematic, right? But if you go in with open mind, if you go in willing to learn, if you go in willing to uh, participate wholly, right? Then you come away with something that you didn't that that you didn't even know was possible. You you grow from the experience, right? It's like having a conversation with somebody. There's two ways to have a conversation. Well, one really only one way, but two types of things happen when people have conversations. Sometimes you're listening and you're prepared to respond, right? So you're just hearing, you're waiting to hear the thing that's going to trigger your response that you already got locked and loaded, right? Or you're actually listening. And you may not respond because you don't have a response. Or you may be able to respond to what's being said. But if you go in locked and loaded with something that's ready, you're not engaging. You're not listening. You're not participating. You're bouncing back, right? Um, and so what we're trying to do, again, create a space for engagement. Just engage. Yeah. I do think there is great opportunity in being a person of no color in a space like that and experiencing discomfort and using that discomfort to begin to relate to your black counterparts who feel that most often in everyday life. Like that little moment of being outside of the sweet spot of the center and feeling kind of uncomfortable and not being visible, that might be the closest that you ever get to experiencing what is an everyday lived experience for most of us. Um, uh, that, that share the skin tone. Yeah. And that is a tremendous awareness opportunity that we also get to offer you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and thinking in space, just saying that is like this idea of be, a, be, be a thermometer, not a thermostat. Come in and understand the temperature. Don't come in and try to change the temperature. Right? <laughs> and so, uh, you have to drop that. Yes. But, but as you may know now, any uh, diversified or, or inclusionary uh, questions, you can send those to Heather Infantry. Uh, <laughs> yes, she will have a swift response for you. She got them covered. Yeah, she has them covered. Those were lock and loaded and ready. Um, um, but, but no, I think you said something, Heather, that's really powerful. It's just like, you don't have to make yourself known in the space. You don't have to... Oh, it was such an amazing, you know, even, in, you know, sometimes an artist talks like, I'm just so happy to, just be happy to be here, you know, and, and write it on a napkin or, you know, keep it in your mind. And so I think it's interesting to understand how to navigate space and interesting understanding how to, like you said, use that as a way to, the work is done when you go back into other communities or your community and then you can have that conversation and then you can be the thermostat and say, guess what? I just came from this space and this is what's happening. And we need to get these, these are things that we can engage with. And I think that that's something that is, is really powerful. And, and even the art of listening. My mom used to always tell me, everyone can listen. Everyone can hear there's an art to listen. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, the art of listening is very powerful. Um, because, you know, I'm guilty. Sometimes I'll be ready with that response or ready for like... You know, like when you're playing double dutch, you're just ready to just jump in. Um, but I think even in the, to, to further that, I want to say this, I think is important too, is that even when we're talking about the African diaspora, as African Americans, when we're having global conversations, we have to also know our power in waiting when we go into conversation. And so sometimes we have to, even within our uh, diaspora conversations, say, you know what? Sometimes we're the center of the world when it comes to things. When I'm talking to this person from West Africa, or I'm talking to this person from Cuba, or I'm talking to this person from wherever, let me really listen and engage and not always interject my African-American experience because some of the feedback that I get sometimes from Pan-African conversations or people talking about that, they're like, man, Mike, I love it, but it always comes back to kind of a African-American centered uh, engagement and and that could be problematic so there's even moments where we have to say you know what 
let me hear your perspective. Like there may be moments, you know, I can, you know, agree or whatever, but let me really listen. And I think a big part of the diaspora is that being open to those differences, right? And and one of my friends used to call me and say, uh, what is it? I want to have a conversation. I was like, do you want to have a conversation? Do I, do I want to just give a statement? And when they were saying that, they were saying like, I just want you to listen. I don't want your feedback. I just want you to be here to listen. And so I think Adama has a beautiful task of holding that space. We talked about it one time. Then one day it may be an Adama talk that's not in English, right? And we have to figure out and translate and see what's going on. But it may be days where we're just engaging and just listening. And I think that's very powerful, even within the diaspora. And so, uh, so it, it, it's just a point that I think is universal, but I think it's really, really important. Um, and I want to speak to anybody that's abroad is that speaking in the diaspora, please bring your experiences and your values to that. Please bring the, your, your site specific and cultural history to the conversation because it's very much valued. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's it. That was it. But any other questions you just directing towards Heather? <laughs> No, that's a good, that's a, that's a great point and a great way to kind of like bring it back to because, you know, I think, uh, you know, I, I think it was Aisha who kind of touched on that a little bit earlier when she was talking about her experience in Cuba. Um, uh, you know, as we, as we endeavor to think about African diaspora, we really have to step outside of all of the sort of frames, you know, racial frames, cultural frames, all those frames that that we've been, you know, conditioned to think through and all those lenses that we've been conditioned to see through, right? We have to be able to, to disrobe all of those things and, and be able to step into a space that allows us to be um, uh, as, as, as pure and as intentional and, and as uh, inclusive in our uh, responses as possible. And that's been one of the great benefits of doing the Adama Art Salon is that it's allowed us as an institution to sit back and listen to our counterparts uh, mm -hmm. other parts of the diaspora as opposed to us coming in and being like, we're Adama and here's what we think you should be mm -hmm. thinking about and here's what we think you should be looking at, right? You know, as opposed, as opposed to us kind of sitting back like, let's, let's bring these people to the table and let them have a conversation. And then we all, not just, you know, uh, Adama, but our, in, uh, entire audience who's tuning in are able to listen and learn uh, in these experiences. Uh, so, uh, are there any other questions that you guys see that you want to respond to, or do we start to like not, let down the landing here? Not a question, but um, a comment. Um, someone asked the question or, or said it would be great for us to offer the salons in other languages and I just responded in the chat saying yes this is on our on our radar and we're looking for software apps other tools and resources to help us to do that so if you know of an app or or a software or resource that we could use I'd love for um, that to be shared in the chat if you know about something that we could use um, closed captioning uh, is another thing that someone mentioned so thank you for that Yeah, we are uh, definitely working on that. Apparently, Zoom has a feature that allows for translators um, to engage. And so we're just trying to figure out how to navigate all of that stuff. So, you know, uh, I, I guess this would be a good point uh, to, to mention, uh, as, as Mike uh, alluded to earlier, Adama is a working board. Um, we're literally shovels in our hands, uh, you know, digging the foundation of this institution. Each one of the people that you heard from today and, and the uh, three who couldn't join us, we're all hands on uh, working this institution from the, the ground up. Uh, and uh, so all that to say that there is no paid staff or anything like that that's doing this work. It, it's all, all us. Um, so if there are any people who are out there who are, who are listening and you have a particular skill set that you think might be of value um, to Adama, we are we welcome uh, 
your your input. Um, we are uh, happy to you know try to work with interns to um, to help us to bring to life some of the ideas and visions that we have as we continue to build. Um, and yeah, you know, just know that you know we're we're, we're doing everything that we can to try to make Adamo be um, uh, the the absolute best um, that it can be. Um, and you know, it's a it will be a a community effort ultimately. This is a total sidebar, but it's just this idea I've been thinking about for like a few months, y'all. And I love Atlanta. I'm based in Nashville, for those who don't know, but I'm originally from Houston, Texas. That's why I had a hat, Houston stand up. Um, but we're talking about the idea of like meeting people where they are. So quick rant real quick. About four or five years ago, I used to sell hair. That's a whole nother conversation for another time. But I went to a Bronner Brothers hair show in Atlanta, Georgia. And it was the blackest, culturally rich experience I've ever, like, outside of House in the Park, which was so culturally rich, I couldn't take it. I almost exploded. I had to go home, take a nap, and come back. Uh, that's also another conversation. But when I went to the Brown Brothers Hair Show, I was like, man, this is amazing, because I think about the idea, really quickly, when you think about museums and galleries, most times the average attendee spends about a minute or two in front of an artwork. But I thought about this idea of how much time we spend in barbershops or salons how these places are our sacred spaces, how when you're talking about black male masculinity, how many men gather in barbershops and sit there for 30 to 45 minutes. And so I have this idea, throwing it out there because somebody might be able to help with it, is I imagine like when I go to Art Basel, you have these beautiful exhibitions, installations. What if in the middle of the Bronner Brother Hair Show that brings thousands of people from all over the nation, a lot of these people are either students that are in cosmetology school, barbers, or a lot of people are owners of salons. Imagine if Adama and other uh, galleries or artists did these pop-up experiences where you would have that diversity that the high and other spaces are wanting to have. You would have them, you have this exhibition in the middle of the Bronner Brother Hair Show. And so I think, I say that to say is I think sometimes even when we think about art, are we really thinking about cultural spaces that are already sacred to us that we can meet people where they are already routine to go? And so um, the hair shows in 2020, I'm just throwing it out there, Brian Brothers Hair Show, uh, is that how are we really thinking about meeting people where they are? And imagine if when I looked at, as a curator, I look up, you know, different mediums, it's very hard when I speak to a lot of black uh, photographers to get their work printed or to really just have a space and market to really sell their work. Then I imagine all of these beauticians that I know and barbers that I know to have these paintings from TJ Maxx and other places inside of their salon, what would happen if you had these beautiful poignant images working on barbershops all over the nation and a person is sitting there engaging with that work for 30 or 45 minutes while they're getting a haircut? That you could have an art book while this young lady is waiting under the dryer and she's flipping through this art book and she's discovering these new artists. And so I'm just throwing it out there to say, these are kind of the ideas of like, how can we meet and engage with people where they are, how can we find and do pop-ups at like the Essence Fest or do pop-ups at these already kind of culturally rich spaces that we gather and then within that, treat these beauticians and artists as docents, empower them so that they go back to their communities, that they go back to their salons, they go back to their barbershops and that they can spread and talk about the power and transformative power of art. And so, that's just something as a, you know, that, that's, that's kind of like my brain fart really quickly as a curator is that it's so hard to get people to come into these spaces. So it's like, how do we come to people? How do we have this at bus stops? How do we have this in schools? How do we have exhibitions that people can project in their homes and you don't have to go to a museum? Every, every Friday on your wall, Adama sends you these beautiful USB proje uh, projections that project on your wall, which you're engaging with this immersive art. How do we create these experiences in these really thoughtful and innovative ways. So I'm throwing it out there because you may have, you know, something that could add to that, but, I, but that is the framework of it is that there's, there was a statistic that came out through Eventbrite um, that said 89% of millennials would much rather pay for experiences than physical things. And so our generation is very much an experience-based economy. I'm saying this really quickly 
because I know people are like, why are you trying to get out of the house and why are they disobeying the orders? But we've been so conditioned as an experience-based economy is that we're trying to go out and engage with these experiences. And though we need to be safe about it, I think it brings a, a beautiful aspect of that. People are wanting to have experiences. Shows are having to be more immersive. Engagements have to be more immersive. And so as a museum, we have to think about more cultural ways to really create these immersive experiences for people to engage in public space, in private space. Um, and so these are just things that we're engaging and talking about amongst ourselves. We're intentional about not having a physical space right now because it gives us a different type of mobility. So all of these things are intentional, but also are in conversation and synthesis of like best ways of how these things will evolve and change. And so I just really want to put that out to people that you're a part of this and please give insight. But we are trying to think very critically um, about reimagining the whole notion of how people even experience art, how art works on people. Because as you know, when you deal with the, the African language, art is, is, has a purpose. Every sculpture, every mass has specific reason and purpose that is used. And so when we're thinking about that, how are we using and engaging and creating a space of art that it has a purpose and has transformative value? Okay, that's my thoughts. Boom. <laughs> But the Bronner Brother Hair Show, I'm telling y'all, don't sleep on that. If it's just come on, y'all, we should do it. It's, it's, it's a dope. It's a dope idea, and I mean, I think um, you know. Again, th this is one of the things that you know for 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 people who are are, are still uh, tuned in and listening. This is how our conversations go, like with 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 the Dama. Like you know, it's it's part uh, business meeting. Part brainstorm session right like you know the 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 the, the, the driving thing behind our, our uh conversations is this unpacking is this asking questions is this figuring out how to be uh um, innovative how to do things that museums have never done before how to do things that museums are unable to do right um because again we're back to, to something that i was uh, saying earlier you know, one of the, the, the driving questions for us is to think about how we as a people experience art mm -hmm. and experience culture. Um, and for us, it's not, you know, for some of us, it's going to a museum and, and walking around, but for many of us, it's not, right? Um, but how do you create a space that, uh, that engages the people who do want to just walk around and look at art? but also engages the people who are looking for more uh, unique experiences um, around art and more unique engagements. How do we create a space where you might, you know, maybe there's a barbershop inside of a dama. You know, I don't know, but you know, the, the idea is that, you know, you create a space that people want to go to where they feel comfortable, uh, where they feel safe, where they feel valued, right? Um, and, you know, build an institution around that. And that's what we're doing. And I just want to say something about space, because actually Mike already kind of spoke to it a little bit. So House in the Park and Spread Love and some of the other events, they are intentionally not in a nightclub. Mm -hmm. Because there are certain kinds of like um, exchanges of energy and affection and whatever we want to call it, that happens when a group of um, black and brown people get together, this like otherworldly thing, intangible thing that happens. Sometimes it can't happen in, a, in certain kinds of spaces. And people don't see that, a lot of people don't always see like the prep that happens before the event occurs, but we are blessing this space. We are sage in this space. We are inviting ancestors in. We are setting intentions for what's going to happen in the space and all this stuff. And sometimes you just can't do that in, in certain spaces. Um, so anyway, I, want, I just wanted to, to, to talk about the fact that we, we, we have the power to create whatever we want in whatever kind of space or not space that we, that we want to. So we really don't have any, any boundaries. We can do whatever we want to do. And that's what I think what you all were saying and I'm excited about. I do want to say one more thing about giving, about donating, because I'm so thrilled to see 
that folks are excited about donating. So the question about where to donate, we've posted the link in there several times. Um, A-D-A-M-A-T-L dot org slash donate. Um, you'll see it there in blue and underlined. But if you wanted to set up um, payments through your bank account or something like that, you can do that as well. So just go to that link and that information is there uh, for you. If you have any questions, I also included the, the email address as well, info at adamatl.com. Yeah. So, all right, we are pushing two hours here. <laughs> Uh, this has been a great uh, conversation, and I'm so grateful uh, to to all of you. I mean, it's been a a really fantastic experience uh, to 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 work on on this uh, vision to to help uh, to bring this this vision to life and to have uh, the support and uh, to have you know this 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 amazing crew this amazing board um you know believes so fully and passionately in the idea uh you know for me it's been a, 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 a true uh testament to the vision but but also just an affirmation of what happens when we as a community uh come together uh to support an idea um and so i just want to say publicly to each of you heather thank you aisha thank you mike thank you val thank you Esohe. Thank you, George. Thank you, Darwin. Thank you. Uh, and to our audience for, for tuning in every week and for your um, passionate input and feedback. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're going to keep pushing, man. And, and we hope that you guys will stay tuned. Um, uh, you know, we'll, we'll be uh, um, announcing, uh, you know, some, some uh, new initiatives and things in the, in the, in the coming weeks, uh, as well as a sort of gift shop, too, so you guys can you know, support us in other ways. Uh, but um, in the meantime, man, we're gonna just keep banging with the Adama Art Salon, keep bringing you really interesting, innovative conversations. We're gonna go multilingual. We're gonna continue to move it around the world. Uh, yeah, we just hope you continue to tune in and, and join us and, and come with your energy. And uh, yeah, 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 all that good stuff. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, so we will uh, see you all next week. Uh, at noon, we'll have the amazing uh, Dr. Deb Willis in conversation with Andrea Barnwell Brownlee from the Spelman Museum. Um, we'll get to take a journey with Dr. Deb uh, uh, to, to learn more about her, her journey as an artist, as a scholar, as a leader um, in the arts. And